Welcome back. We continue our uh, investigation of the fundamentals of satellite navigation. Last time we talked about the satellites themselves, their placement in medium Earth orbit, and now we'll talk about the navigation message. Recall the satellites send the radio signals. The navigation message is that item, that uh, communication which carries the key information where is the satellite and when did it broadcast the signal? The navigation signals we'll come to later on. Please regard them as something that goes on in parallel with the navigation message. The pseudo ranging measurement is the fundamental measurement uh, that we'll talk about. That's really what the nav message and the nav signal enable. And performance from all of this is about five meters or so. The key thing about the navigation message is that the satellite needs to tell you some things. It needs to tell you its location. By the way, that location is called the ephemerides. So please hang on to that term. It is critical to the study of satellite navigation. It's not such an easy thing to do. The satellite is moving at about 3,000 meters per second, somewhere around two miles per second. And the determination of what the location of the satellite is is so-called orbit determination. That is a big challenge that was overcome for GPS. And to do that in real time, to support people trying to figure out where they are moment by moment was, was a, a major feat. In addition to the location of the satellite, we need to know the time of transmission. At what time is the, are those signals, those ranging signals that we'll come to, actually initiated, broadcast by the satellite? Uh, one of the items required to really control that time of transmission were uh, space-qualified atomic clocks, and that was another big challenge and hurdle associated with GPS. This information describing location and time gets sent by each satellite at about 50 bits per second. And if you're aware of modern Wi-Fi, modern Wi-Fi works at tens or even hundreds of millions of bits per second. And so, wow, why did GPS only use 50 bits per second? Why so low? Well, first of all, the data is coming from 20,000 kilometers away. And so that message is quite weak by the time it reaches the user equipment. And so we couldn't afford to send very high data rates. And so data compression was needed. And in fact, the GPS designers were able to get all that information about ephemeris and clock into this very low rate data message of 50 bits per second. In other words, no more was needed. So they accomplished something major there as well. Now, it's nice that the satellite is telling us where it's located. It's nice that it's telling us its time offset relative to GPS system time. In other words, the offset between the in fact time of transmission and the uh, uh, nominal time of transmission as measured by the GPS clock. Uh, how does the satellite know those things? And so if we proceed to the next look here, we have a look of the GPS operational control segment, uh, otherwise known as the ground control segment. And uh, this is back in 2008, but the architecture or the topology of the operational control segment doesn't change much from uh, year to year. And if you look closely, you'll see that this is nicely color-coded. And the original GPS stations were, were in Hawaii, Schriever Air Force Base in Colorado, Ascension Island out in the middle of the South Atlantic, Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and Kwajalein here in the Western Pacific. And spread along the globe like that, they maintained fairly full coverage of the whole constellation. From time to time, one of the satellites would not be in view of one of these, but for the most part, all the satellites were in continuous view. And what has happened since is that they've augmented that basic network with the additional stations that you see there, the red diamonds, and then they have plans for some future monitoring stations as well. 
And so all of those items that you see on that world map are ingesting GPS measurements. And the location of these stations is very well known. And so we have the GPS problem in reverse. These stations, given that their location is well known, are used to figure out where the satellites are and what the satellite clocks are doing. That information, those measurements, is backhauled to the master stations included in this set here, where a message is put together and sent up to the satellite, more or less conveying to the satellite the information that it needs to send to the users about the satellite location and the satellite clock. So that's the basic operation of the GPS ground control segment. Here it is in words, and uh, each satellite continuously uh, is being tracked by the ground control segment. And uh, so the, we can say the ground control segment, sometimes known now as OCX, Operational Control uh, System, is tracking the GPS satellites, estimating the clock and orbit for all of them, keeping GPS time and uploading that data to describe the clock and or orbit for each satellite. And that's done on an approximately hour basis. We're updating that information. And very infrequently, the ground control segment ha has some heavier responsibilities. It may actually command the satellite to move in its orbit. And we do that just to keep it nominally in that, those birdcage orbits that I showed you earlier on. And so those maneuvers tend to be small. They might happen about once a year or so. At the time of those maneuvers, the satellite is set unhealthy. The users are warned, don't, don't use the satellite right now, we're moving it. Um, also, on a very infrequent basis, the ground control segment might actually command corrections to the physical clock on board the satellites. That's done very infrequently. Nominally, what we do is we just send some information up to the satellite that describes the offset in time between the satellite time and GPS system time. And so that information is included digitally rather than as a physical adjustment of the clock. And then finally, on an even more infrequent basis, the ground control segment might command a major re relocation of a satellite. So if we had an unexpected failure of a satellite in an orbit, we may, may have to move one or more of the other satellites in that same orbit to compensate for the loss of that satellite. So that kind of dynamicism is uh, anticipated by GPS as well. Here's a picture of the actual navigation message, how it's formatted. And this is the data being sent by the satellite. And for each satellite, the user equipment needs to open up this message and look into this format and extract the data that it needs. And it's broken into subframes, and each subframe takes about six seconds. So that's the time required to send that. And so six seconds for subframe one, another six, another six, another six. And so it takes all told 30 seconds to go through the critical data needed to use GPS for position fixing. That's per satellite. And in parallel is the, are the navigation signals. So think about a GPS as a system of satellites uh, where you have to have at least four of those satellites in view. We'll come back to that soon enough when we're talking about pseudo-ranging, why four? And for each of those four, we have to have these two threads of information, one being the navigation message and the other being the navigation signals. So all told, you have the four satellites times, times the two threads or eight threads of data that you're uh, continuously opening and processing. Subframe one contains basic bookkeeping information, GPS week number, what satellite are you looking at, what's its accuracy, what's its health, and subframes two and three contain that ephemeris information that we highlighted. This is the information that tells you where the satellite is. Subframe four and five are almanacs. 
And by almanacs, we mean this data includes information about the satellite that you're viewing, but it also includes information about all the other satellites available uh, to a GPS user. And so that information is handy for the receiver because very often when it's trying to get synchronized and trying to do a first position fix based on GPS, it will capture the strongest signal. And the benefit of the almanac is once you've captured the strongest signal, you can look into the nav message for that strongest satellite and figure out where to look for the other satellites. So that's the, the, the idea there. Last word on this view graph is uh, the 30 seconds. Well, first of all, subframes four and five don't get to send all of their information in a single subframe. After all, it's the almanac for the entire constellation. And so you have to actually page through until you get up uh, to a number that includes all of the other satellites in the constellation. So paging through all of that stuff can take as long as 12 and a half minutes. Um, <clears throat> 12 and a half minutes is certainly a long time. 30 seconds is also a long time, especially if you're trying to use your mobile phone, maybe for an emergency call, maybe just to figure out where you are. And so later in the course, we'll come to a concept called assisted GPS. And in assisted GPS, the user actually gets the ephemeris and clock information over the cell phone link rather than through the satellite link. And the reason is, just to short circuit to really shorten the amount of time required to get all the critical information. As we mentioned a moment ago, uh, the GPS satellite sends information about its own location in the navigation message. This information is critical. Without that, GPS certainly doesn't work. We need to know the location of the satellite that's sending the signal down to the user. And to compactly send that information, the GPS system uses so-called Keplerian elements or the Keplerian parameters. And these are due to Johannes Kepler himself. We can break them into three categories. The first category describes the shape of the ellipse itself. So it does not connect the ellipse to the Earth. It does not attempt to place the satellite in the ellipse. It's just a description of the ellipse shape itself. And this long axis is twice A. It's called the major axis, as opposed to the minor axis, which would cross uh, the shortest, uh, 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 in the shortest direction. And what's sent is A, which is the semi, in other words, half the major axis. So that's the first of the Keplerian parameters. The next Keplerian parameter is E, the eccentricity. Now, if E is equal to zero, which means that it's not eccentric, what we're saying there is that the orbit is circular. It's a perfect circle. Uh, we don't have to invoke an ellipse to describe it. And the GPS orbits are very close to circular. However, they're not perfect circles. And because we're trying to achieve one meter accuracy, half meter accuracy, we do have to go with the more sophisticated description that allows for these uh, ellipses to be just that, ellipses as opposed to perfect circles. So these first two parameters, A and E, describe the shape of the orbit. The next three parameters describe how the orbit is oriented relative to the Earth. So the Earth is down here at one of the foci. Don't take that as the center of the ellipse. Remember that uh, the, the uh, satellite revolves around the Earth in an elliptic orbit where the uh, Earth is located at one of the foci, not necessarily at the center. Here's the satellite. And the three parameters that we're talking about now position the orbit relative to the Earth. The first of those describes the pitch or the angle with which the orbital plane 
or uh, that the orbital plane makes with the equatorial plane. So we call that I or inclination. And it appears just here, the angle made by the orbital plane relative to the equatorial plane. The next angle that's important is capital omega. It's called the right ascension. of the ascending node. I'll just abbreviate here, ascending node. And it is the angle made by this vector that goes from the Earth's center out to the location where the satellite punches upward through the equatorial plane. And that's this uh, capital omega, this angle here. And it turns out that in the case of GPS, the orbits, the satellites, are uh, organized into six different orbits. And those six different orbits differ mainly by this capital omega. So you can kind of imagine a fan of orbits as you go around and look at the GPS constellation. So in terms of placing the orbit relative to the Earth, so far we have I, the inclination. And then we have capital omega, the right ascension of the ascending node. The final angle we need is lowercase omega. And that is the angle made from the ascending node up to a vector that goes out through perigee. So it places the orbit by orienting the perigee relative to all the possible locations it could have in the 360 degrees of the ellipse as we would go around the Earth. So, to review, to describe the shape of the orbit, we have A, the semi-major axis, E, the eccentricity. To orient or fix the orbit relative to the Earth, we have the uh, inclination, lowercase i, the right ascension of the ascending node, capital omega, and the angle of perigee, lowercase omega. We have one parameter left, and I think you can foresee that we need that here simply to place the satellite in the orbit. Because so far we've described the shape of the orbit, we have oriented the orbit relative to the Earth, and now finally we have to place the satellite in that orbit, and this angle is called nu, or the true anomaly. So, those are the six Keplerian parameters. This is the uh, arguably the most important data coming down in the GPS navigation message. I think you would have to rank the description of the GPS uh, satellite clock offset as equally important, but these are really uh, the, the major things and the most important things coming in the navigation message. So, um, when we come back, we'll turn our attention away from the navigation message to the navigation signals, and I look forward to talking with you about that. Thank you.